So, like I said, my name is Chris Good. Um, I'm the communications director for Tidal Track and the Clean Water Campaign for Michigan. Uh, we're working in the arena of using uh, creative practice to work on behalf of clean water, racial equity, and youth empowerment. And, and one of our programs is hosting these panel discussions here at Harvest Gathering this year. We have nine panels available for folks to dig into on a variety of topics, so um, please continue to join us for those. Um, we're gonna, for this, for this session here, we're going to, there's so many, so many pressing issues to explore with Great Lakes Protection, um, but we're really gonna focus here um, by learning more of the stories and the expertise of these folks up here who are just doing tremendous work. We're so lucky to have them with us here today. Um, so we'd like to invite just a round of, of introductions for folks to uh, share a little bit about what they're up to, where they come from, and, and how about, how about a story, a first resonant story, memory of, of water in your life? Uh, my name is Marky Miller, um, from Toledo, Ohio, but I grew up in Michigan. So I have a lot of fond childhood memories of going up north, always going to water, going to find beaches and, and having that that call every summer you know that was that was where my roots were that was where I still feel my sense of place today um, you know growing up in Toledo though I didn't realize how close I was to Lake Erie until I was older because we didn't go there it was not a lake that people wanted to go to it was not a, a place that was advertised heavily in the area to this is where you come to get away to swim it was, oh, that's, that's the dirty lake. That's the polluted lake. That lake died already. So, you know, it, it kind of got put on the shelf. So it feels really special to me to also get to be part of working with the Great Lakes in my, in my adult life, but also going back and, and trying to mend that relationship that I, I didn't get to have with a lake that was so close to me throughout my entire childhood. Um, I'm, I'm an organizer with Toledoans for Safe Water. In 2014, my community and surrounding areas of about 500,000 people, we lost access to our drinking water. Um, do not touch, do not drink, don't, don't shower, don't water your lawns uh, because of a, a toxic al algal bloom um, called cyanobacteria. And we waited, we waited for help, we waited for action. Uh, we didn't see it, so we got organized. We wrote our own law called the Lake Erie Bill of Rights that recognizes the legal right of Lake Erie to exist, thrive, and flourish. And we're gonna keep pushing for that and hopefully for the rest of the Great Lakes. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh Shaska Nimki Nindodom, Traverse City Nindonjaba, uh San Felipe Pueblo Nindonjaba. I'm Holly Bird, that's my English name. Uh, my real name is uh, Blue Lightning Woman, and I'm Thunder Clan from San Felipe Pueblo. I live in Traverse City next to this guy somewhere. And uh, um, thank you, I'm so happy to be here, miigwech. Um, my background is, um, I'm an attorney, and um, I've done work for years in the native community. Um, have always been an environmentalist. I think I worked for Purgem when I was in college. Um, always, you know, raising a fist somewhere. But, um, uh, my real call to what I call the Water Clan movement, uh, you know, happened at Standing Rock, and and before then, I mean, I was always part of everything, but that was a um, that was when I became extremely active, um, and have basically not barely slept ever since. <laughs> as as uh, unfortunately, I think we're we need to do at this point. Um, I'm the. Uh, ground coordinator. I was the ground coordinator for uh, the Water Protectors Legal Collective at Standing Rock. I was the live-in attorney at camp. I continue with them as a board member and a volunteer um, attorney. I created the Water Protectors Legal Task Force here in Michigan. Um, I work with lots of organizations everywhere. I'm a, on a board of Title Track. Me and Chris are. Or he's our staff member. I'm sorry. I keep making him a board member. <laughs> Um, board member just means that you don't get paid. <laughs> so maybe he'll rather stay as a staff person. <laughs> but um, 
And so I'm, I'm very fortunate to get to work with a lot of good people um, on all of these issues, whether it's you know through our native communities, through the larger community with Flow or NIMIAC or Oil and Water Don't Mix. Um, we're all trying to work together. And um, let's see, a resonant water story. I mean, besides being created in water, um, I think like Marky, you know, I I remember I was always being brought up to the to the lakes. I mean, we're one of the things that we almost take for granted is the fact that we live here. And um, I remember remember meeting somebody from the Middle East who saw um, one of our lakes. I think they were on Lake Michigan, and um, they said, "Oh, is that your ocean?" Like they hadn't been in it. And someone was like, "Well, no, that's our lake." And he's like, "What do you mean, lake?" And we're like, oh, it's fresh water. And he goes, that's fresh water? Like, we call that sweet water where I'm from. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, we have, you know, we have Lake Michigan, we have Lake Superior, and showed him. And the guy just started crying. Like, he couldn't believe that this existed. And I feel the same way every day, you know, when I see um, see the water out there. Nabi is, is um, of course, for us, has a real spiritual connotation. But... Um, as far as like remembering things and, and when I first became conscious of something beyond the normal, like I drink water, I get sand in my shoes, you know, that sort of thing. I swim in water, um, don't pee in the pool. You know, it was, uh, I do remember when I was younger, probably in third or fourth grade, I used to get tonsillitis like on a regular, every like a couple times a year I would get tonsillitis. And my mom was a, she had been medically trained, so, that, which meant I never went to the doctor. <laughs> and um, so we'd stay home and we'd manage it. And to this day, I've never had my tonsils removed, actually. But immediately when I got sick, the only thing I ever wanted to do was to take a bath. And so when I was feeling really bad, I would take like five baths a day, you know, as a kid. And I just remembered feeling better, consciously feeling better, almost like falling asleep in the tub. Um, and realizing at a very young age the healing power of water. And I didn't know why, and I, nobody was telling me that at that age, but that's my first conscious memory of, okay, this is something for something other than what we drink or use for ourselves. It's beyond me. Yeah, yeah. sure. And I still use it that way you know, to this day um, for everybody. So one, of the, one thing I can share one of the ceremonies we have as um, Native people, and one of my aunts showed me this, was when you get up first thing in the morning, you should take a, a glass of water, um, you know, tap water, whatever you have, uh, if you can. I, I lived on Lake Erie, too, for a while, so we'll talk about that later. But, um, and you hold it up to the morning sun, you know, or whatever light is coming through, but the morning sun, and you, you ask for creator to recognize this water as medicine and to, to allow your body to use this as medicine. And you, you ask the water, the spirit of the water for that, and then you drink it. And, it, and it's medicine for your body. So, and you transform it with that, that thought and that intention into something that um, is what you need. So, miigwech. <coughs> My name is Nabish Kimwabikizi. Um, my uh, grandfather's clan is uh, Crane, and my grandmother's clan is Turtle. Uh, I just wanted to say I really appreciated hearing that beautiful story about uh, the sweet water that kind of really like uh, making me tear up because. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm a commercial fisherman and so from uh, Beaver Island, and so I, my family has always had a really intimate connection with like uh, the water and as it being like a source of life and kind of dealing with that every day. You know, it's something we we deal with as like a, uh, like a potential for like our passing too. And so it, it, being a commercial fisherman from the islands there, we have a really intimate connection with the water and, and I, I've been involved with that for about five years and uh, only just found out about the pipeline probably like the last two or three and 
just like the state in, it's in now, it's it's a real big concern for me as a commercial fisherman and somebody who likes to exercise my treaty rights. And that's how my family and my people have survived for a long time, hundreds and thousands of years. And, um, you know, nobody wants, you know, oily fish. And uh, just to kind of cover uh, a little bit of basic information around that, you know, that, that pipeline's like, I want to say 16 years old past its past its due date, I think it was supposed to be 50 years old, um, so now it's running on 66 years old. Um, about, I want to say, the Grand Traverse Band has a, uh, a PDF that you can look up that has real hard facts on everything to give a good overview on everything, so some of that includes like 23% um, degradation of like its, uh, its wall thicknesses. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize is that 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 pipeline comes from Canada and splits off into two separate pipelines underneath those waters so that's twice the uh, the risk and degradation that's going through both of those pipelines so um, it's not that we you know should be worried about a spill because Enbridge and these this specific pipeline alone has had around 22 spills and leaks throughout Michigan alone uh, including one of the U.S.'s worst inland oil spills in Kalamazoo. Um, and so it's, you know, there's no reason for us to risk our, our water like that. I mean, it, even logistically looking at something underwater in Mackinac City compared to like Kalamazoo where there's lots of infrastructure and people and resources to get there and stop it and help it and so and so versus under the water in Mackinac around the UP where there's a lot less people, like no infrastructure basically compared to, you know, downstate in the cities to deal with something like that, you know, let alone, uh, it was a, a utility worker who found Enbridge's uh, uh, spill down in Kalamazoo. They, and, and hydrologically, like I do uh, like hydraulics like um, systems and stuff like that, like you can tell when there's a change in pressure or a leak or anything like that. So. Um, they had apparently just let it keep flowing for 18 hours until a utility worker made it known to everybody what was going on and they shut it down 18 hours after they knew about it, you know. So about 22 million gallons spilled alone just between the time of finding it and shutting it off. That's not everything beforehand and everything dealing with afterwards and they, they really only spread grass seed over it. So if you go down there, you can dig in the muck and, and find the oil right away. So. Um, I would just say uh, the, the most important thing that I think any of us can do is talk about it because a lot of people don't know about it. Even people you would think that are heavily involved around it. I, I think about one in five every job in Michigan deals with uh, water, um, let alone uh, I think it's like a 36-ish billion dollar a year industry for um, like housing, rentals, and tourism for Michigan, which you know nobody wants to come up to oily beaches and fish for oily fish, you know, so it's not just like our well-being and our future, you know, our, our family's health and well-being, but it's also like our, our family's future economically, you know. We want people to have jobs and not be struggling, you know, the next so-and-so generations, let alone, you know, be sick every day drinking bad water. Yeah, that's... Do <laughs> you uh, have a memory? Oh, yeah, um, I would say... Uh, uh, a memory, um, what, something that's really stuck with me other than like just being out on the water fishing because like every day is yeah. really, really something uh, getting to be out there. Uh, but uh, we, some other water protectors and I at Mackinac Day like revitalized like some old ceremonies and um, people used to uh, make offerings to a, a certain spirit like that like kind of resides over like the, the the water domain and like underneath the earth and um, there's a prophecy about how that uh, that spirit will uh, actually reincarnate and like uh, help defeat like the black snakes and nowadays you know people identify the black snakes as like the pipelines which is really interesting and so we did this ceremony and uh, you know, afterwards we, we threw like some hard boiled eggs out into the water, like probably like a good like 200 feet away, you know, and then came back, you know, uh, hours later and 
between all the rocks and how far away like we threw these these hard boiled eggs from um, and all the birds we walked back to the ceremony site and uh, there was just a single hard boiled egg without its shell just sitting there perfectly on the shore just right up from where we did the the ceremony so it was just like so profound to like see that and experience that it was kind of like a good sign I guess <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, one, one thing that, that we found in, in some of our work is, is, is the importance of, of telling these stories, these personal stories. Appreciate your willingness to share some of those more personal memories. Um, this, uh, this capitalist culture rooted in white supremacy, colonial um, history, relates to water as, as a resource, as something to extract, as something to exploit. And so I think to tell some of these stories shifts us into a space of being in relationship with water and thinking about water as, as neighbor, friend, family. Um, and I think that is, that is, a, is, uh, is a way that is, is effective in communicating how truly we all need to be and rely on water for our health and, and, and well-being and to be in right relationship with the water and the earth. Um, so I invite all of you to think about some of those stories that you can reflect on and from your own lives as well as when you engage your friends and communities in these important conversations that we all need to be engaged in at these times. So um, through this, this gathering here, we're gonna be exploring some of the encouraging um, issues and movements that are happening around water in the region and, and um, invite you all in to be a part of that and, and have a call of action of sorts um, at the end of this time and in the following workshop. Um, but I'd like to ask our panelists here to, to share a little bit about some of the challenges that they're facing in their work. Um, and then if, if there are any particular um, strategies or reflections that you've had in that space that have been effective at, at shifting the conversation because I, I feel like Water, water becomes a very emotional topic for people. Um, and so curious to hear more just about challenges and, and any shifts in strategy or um, conversation that you've had that have been able to, to help in that space. Yeah. Where do I start? Um, <laughs> challenges, yeah, we, we've been challenged at every step of the way, um, but that's kind of the fun part too. So when we got organized, when we got started, we knew that we didn't want to take the route of traditional activism. We knew that, okay, we've had these policies in place for the last four decades. Things are getting worse. Something needs to change. This can't be about electing the right people anymore. This has to be about empowering the right people. And um, we spent two years collecting 10,500 signatures and when we were, we, we went to turn those in and get them validated by our Board of Elections, we were immediately rejected from the ballot, kept off, told you're not allowed to vote on this. And then the fight became also about protecting our democratic rights too. So we were in and out of the Supreme Court. We were back and forth, we were protesting. Um, but you know, it's, it's out of those challenges that you force decisions to be made. You know, it's, it's those confrontations that create change. So uh, we, we didn't really win the Supreme Court, but in a roundabout way, we ended up getting what we wanted because we forced them to come out and make a decision about what is okay and what's not okay and earned ourselves um, a special election. But when you're dealing with, with true grassroots organizing, um, you know, we're all volunteers. We're all self-funded, we're, we're asking the community for donations. We spent $6,000 on our entire campaign. Um, two weeks before our election, this huge opposition campaign came out. And we didn't find out till after the campaign that it was funded solely by BP um, out of Houston, Texas. Wow. And they spent $300,000 trying to stop us from voting on this. Um, so, you know, when you're, when you're running into obstacles, you must be doing something right because you're, you're pissing off the right people. Um, you know, so I guess the, those, those little challenges are, are always gonna be there. And even now, after 61% of my community said, yes, we want rights for Lake Erie, 
Um, we have the state legislator passing a law saying, you know what, we don't want rights of nature for anyone in the state. And they wrote that into our state budget bill. Um, we did some research, did some digging, and found that that language was written by the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, handed to an, an elected official after the deadline for putting things through. So there was no chance for testimony, there was no chance for finding it out. It was the day before the vote. And so now we're up against that, but um, I don't care. Uh, it's not going to stop me. It's not going to stop anybody in my group. And I'm not going to sit back and feel like I need to recognize laws passed by a government that doesn't recognize me, that doesn't recognize my community. So um, embrace the, the, the challenges and embrace those obstacles because you're on the right path if you're, if you're running into those. Um, you know, I guess, I don't know if I even answered the question now, but um, there's, there were so many different challenges I could, I could sit here and think of. You know, every time we'd get, we'd get ahead, some, some, someone would find a creative way to, to stop you, but um, movements take time, you know, and it, it's not going to be one issue. I know that the Lake Erie Bill of Rights is not going to be the one thing that makes this happen, but when you have the 14 communities that came before Toledo, just in the state of Ohio, who were kept off the ballot, kept off the ballot, kept off the ballot, and then we get to open that door for them to say, hey, guess what? We got rid of that rule that says you can't be on the ballot. Um, you know, you open the door for, for so many communities, and you know that it's just going to be building and building and building, and we, we always try to recognize all those people who fought before us who just couldn't cross the finish line um, because they didn't give up, so neither can we. Thank you. Thank you. I, I agree with you so much on that. The, um, one of the things, like you had mentioned Kalamazoo, and 18 hours, I'm not sure if everybody knows that the federal guidelines, which the pipelines have to follow, they, you know, they kind of do this to the state, um, only requires them to report an oil spill within 10 days. So technically, it can be going and they don't have to report it for 10 days. The other thing is that um, people actually died in Kalamazoo. I mean, I don't, I don't think people realize that. And people are still dying because of the oil spill. <laughs> and that's something that's brushed under the rug. There's a lot of very sick people in Kalamazoo as a result of the oil spill. Onbridge is spending lots and lots of money to sweep all of that under the rug. And we're seeing it now. Like one of the things, um, I get calls from a lot of the activists in the water work because I'm, I'm basically like a protector of the protectors. And um, like when they were going over the bridge recently on the Labor Day walk, they all said, oh my God, Onbridge is busting up activists. Like they're bringing people that, to come and talk to people and to try to shout at Governor uh, Whitmer and blah, blah, blah. And I just started laughing. I was like, how desperate are they? <laughs> like they're paying people to come up there to be, to counter the protesters, you know? And I just, well, that's awesome. You know, like, hey, you guys are doing something. And then of course they're paying off um, and um, leaning on our, our local commissioners to pass uh, resolutions supporting the tunnel. So that, you know, it, it shows that we are doing something right. But I agree with Marky, we can't wait for all of our politicians either. I mean, we, th we thought Whitmer was going to protect the lake. I'm sorry. She's not doing it. You know, she's not doing it. Um, she's not, she's not going to join in with Dana Nessel on the, on the litigation. And why is that? Because it's politically not with, within her um, well-being to do so. So it has, to be a, it has to be a citizen approach. It has to be enough people saying, you know what, this is nonpartisan. This is about the health, the beauty of everything. The lakes and all of the inland, I mean, everything that we have right now is completely 100% dependent on the Great Lakes. All the veins of, of our earth run from the Great Lakes into the inner parts of the state. So even if you live inland and don't see a Great Lake for a couple of hours, you're, you're still gonna be affected by an oil spill. So, um, but I, I agree, it's, it takes the citizen approach. It takes talking to your neighbor. It talks taking, you know, talk, I was telling somebody else, it, it takes talking to that racist old, 
you know, uh, Mustang loving uncle that you have to talk about why we don't need fossil fuels, right? It's, it, it's to talk about these facts that we know that, yeah, we can do this without it. We can do without it, but we can't do without water. Try it. <laughs> you know, try it. How about if we uh, don't bring you any water, we shut off your water for, you know, a week. And then you can see how you feel about it. So, um, but, and mostly it just takes people to stand up and do it. You know, some of the obstacles that I see, aside from the, the politicians who don't do what they say they're going to do, aside from Onbridge, um, who makes me laugh on a daily basis, but, you know, support the people that are out here doing it. You know, I always say I'm the poorest attorney in the state. Um, all of these lovely people are too, you know, they're not, they're not getting paid for any of this. And, and um, people like Marky, people like Nabish, they spend hours and hours and days. And, um, you know, in our community, we have a thing where we say, um, you know, we support each other. Like if I have a friend, even though I know he's kind of a jerk somewhere in camp, but he needs a ride to work, our little network of water clan will get on the phone and say, who has a ride for this guy? He needs to get, he needs to feed himself. You know, and that could be, this happened the other day, someone who was in Manistee and needed a ride to Muskegon, and I, we got him a ride. You know, so it's, it's about taking care of each other too, because that, tr that trauma and the burnout from doing the work and then just not being able to feed ourselves is a very big issue. So we want to keep continuing marching along and um, people in Flint, you know, that was an, another thing I've heard from them, they're sick. You know, the, even the activists, they're, they're sick. They need as much help as they can get, you know. So don't think that you can help, whether it's a meal that you serve to somebody or say, hey, come on over, let me feed you one day. Or can I give you some gas money, you know. Anything that you can do or even just words of encouragement, right. So thank you so much. Yeah, I, I agree with you guys. Uh, the one, the one of the biggest things I think we discovered and made a difference in um, in Mackinac this last year was um, I was looking on the uh, the like um, the public um, references for like uh, who owns what properties and the taxes they're paying, and was kind of looking around the Enbridge Station there, and uh, we had found out that like they had bought. Um, multiple properties that like where the the property value was like it just nonsensical compared to what Enbridge had paid to bring the taxes up on some of these properties so that nobody can come in and buy up properties around their stuff like uh, one, one of the houses was like I want to say it was it was on Zillow for like 65,000 and the property taxes were like 48,000 um, and uh, and uh, even more so on another property. Um, and, and they, they work with another company called Tri-State Holdings, um, which they would use Tri-State Holdings to go to these property owners who didn't want to sell the Enbridge and would buy through Tri-State Holdings, you know, under another name, offer them a good price or whatever, you know, um, and bought out this entire, like, um, probably two square mile, like, neighborhood. Um, and one of the last people that, um, was there we, we we heard from a story from a local that um that he didn't he didn't want to sell you know he didn't want this company to come in and just take everyone's homes um and because they had brought bought everything around his house they were just gonna apparently claim uh, eminent domain and take over his bulldoze his property out um and they come in and swooped out some of these houses so quick that the gentleman that we we learned this from um was actually uh, going to visit a friend and uh, um, and there was just security at his house, you know, saying you can't be here. It's private road, you know. It's like you know, my friend lives here, and so they they kicked him out before his friend could even get a hold of him and find out, you know, and let him know. Like so, they they push people out like out of these communities to get their ways, and 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 around this whole area, they had also um, submitted a petition to to the uh, city council and uh, county commissioners. And bought out this um, this public road and turned it into a private road. So they're slowly just kind of expanding their whole little grip on this this which was a neighborhood, and now it's just all owned by Enbridge and Tri-State Holdings. And you know they just 
swap in and out. Like uh, a lot of their employees are um, people who uh, um, have criminal records, and so they sh shuttle them around to different job sites and stuff. And a lot of that links in with uh, a big issue for the indigenous communities now where we, we have um, a lot of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and a lot of these show up around, a lot of missing women and kids show up around like these, these man camps they call them when they come in because these people are just repeat offenders that they shuttle around the country. Um, so there, there's a lot more things that happen to the communities other than currently and now before like they, they pollute our water, you know, there's, there's things that hurt, you know, our women and children and and they, you know, these people do bring in like lots of drugs and stuff because they, they, you know, they get paid a lot of money and they want to work 24 hours. And, you know, growing up, uh, even in northern Michigan, I've heard of pipeliners and stuff and people coming to Michigan and, you know, just getting methed out and stuff and working every day constantly. And, you know, so it is an issue that there's a lot, a lot of things that come with these organizations coming into our communities, you know, people are losing their homes and, you know, they're bringing in problems. And so, like you guys were saying too, is the biggest issue is talking to people who don't want to hear about it, which a lot of times is, you know, various family members of all of ours, you know? So we, we do need that, you know, bring bring the conversation to the table, you know, and, and not, don't push it on people, but just give people the real facts, you know, the real bipartisan facts that, really show how it affects all of us. We've had some folks join us here in the last couple minutes. Uh, we're talking about Great Lakes protection here. These folks here on the panel are representing uh, various communities across the region, doing a lot of great work. We have um, some organizations just over here on the hill that have information, so please make sure you stop in and, and engage the folks' uh, title track table. I know Marky has a table over there with the uh, Lake Erie Bill of Rights. Um, Michigan League of Conservation Voters doing tremendous work across the state. They're over there, so make sure you're plugged into to that work um, as we leave from this space. We're, we're going to be moving down the hill in a little bit to Maddie's Circle. Um, to continue the conversation, questions and answers. I know there's a lot of wisdom out here in the community um, and ways to get involved. So wanted to wrap up this time. We have about eight, seven, eight minutes left here um, in, this, in this time. Oh, also wanted to make a point. Water equity and affordability is another title track panel that's happening at one o'clock down at the Cedar stage. Some uh, fantastic panelists from, from Flint will be a part of that conversation. Um, I appreciated Holly you mentioning, acknowledging just how everyone, everyone has a part to play. Everyone has, has something to contribute. Um, I just came straight to, to Harvest here from a One Water uh, conference down in Austin where my mind was just blown by some of these waste water sewage professionals who are some of, you know, in some cities and some municipalities, some of the most forward thinking visionary folks at the table. And those are partners that I would not have even thought about, you know? Um, I wondered if each of us could just do a, a quick round of, of maybe surprising partners or, or in the midst of these challenges as you're working to build the movement and build coalitions, um, kind of moments where everyone has a part to play, even people you might not have thought um, could be kind of a nice way for us to, to move into our, our workshop time. We, we got support pretty early on from a, a local farmers union, which was really crucial for us because we were pegged early on as being anti-farmer. We were, we were trying to take down the family farm um, when really we were, we were talking about industrialized agriculture that had been built on a wetland <laughs> that we knew could not be sustained. Um, so that was, that was a really great uh, partnership for us to, to have. Uh, but I will say that a lot of our organizing group and the members who went out to collect signatures and do the campaign, many of us were in our 20s and 30s and going to school, working multiple jobs, raising a family, dealing with all of those struggles to make sure that we have health care and that we're taken care of and, and you know we're okay and functioning. Um, we didn't have a lot of free time. We didn't have time to go out and, and talk one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people. We, we had to rely on social media. We, 
we had to try and get people to come to meetings at 7.30 on a Friday night. You know, we were competing with, with social lives from everybody. Um, but when we were out watching people come in to vote, uh, I was out early in the day and, and there were the people who were, re you know, retirees. And I thought, gosh, this is a group we just couldn't connect with because of our schedules. And, and they said, my, my daughter told me about you guys. My grandson told me about you guys. And I, I love what you're doing. And, you know, I grew up here in, in the 60s and the 70s when the lake died once before. I watched this happen once already, and I can't believe I'm watching it happen again. Um, so it was really cool to see that word was spreading between generations, you know, and, and here I'm being accused of, of taking down third and fourth generation family farms, but there's fourth and fifth generation Toledoans who are, are watching, you know, their grandkids be pulled out of the water, be told don't go in there, and, and they, have to, they have to go through this again. So that was a really cool thing to see happen organically on its own. One of the things I want to speak to, and this kind of goes back and it'll, it'll round up with the answer to the question. Um, Nabish um, told us about the, the water spirit that they did a ceremony for, and there's, there's two water spirits, and one of the things that, um, there's a whole reason why they feed them the hard boiled eggs, but uh, my clan is Thunder Clan is actually related to these, these water spirits, as are all the other water clan um, clans and um, so through that you'll see that there's a, a ton of Thunder Clan involved in this movement and in fact they use the Thunderbird as the one of the symbols for the movement but one of the things that we know from our culture and our ceremony that that happened is that um, when the call was put out to, to protect the water and uh, unlike some of our clans that have been formed by our people or by the, the ancestors that we have, this was a call that was put out by the earth. And when, when that happened, when she did that, she formed a water clan. And that includes everybody that, that is part of that. So um, for me, you know, when I run into people that are doing this work, it doesn't matter if you're native or you're part of Thunder Clan, you know, you're my sister. She's water clan. She, she may not know she's water clan. Right, but I identify her as Water Clan. Um, the uh, and and the same goes for anybody doing the work. You are my relative in this clan, so we have you know we treat each other like relatives now. The um, which is why we help each other, <laughs> you know, when we need help. But um, the most out of all of that, the most surprising part of that that happened for me was when I was at Standing Rock, and um, which in itself was a hugely immense experience for me as a Native American. You know, we got there was the first time in history that we had almost every tribe represented in one space together. And, and then we had tribes from across the world. But fully 50% of that camp was non-Native. And that in itself, that was, that was what was the most surprising to me. It was the first time in history that anybody came up with us that um, from what we call the colonizer society that actually stood with us, that got tear gassed with us, that got beaten with us, um, and, and did all of those things. And it's really funny because um, out of a lot of the stories that I hear, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional, from, from people that were frontline, some of the ones that touched native hearts the most were seeing law enforcement take um, physically abusive actions against other white people because they're like, oh my God, if you would do that to part of your own people, you're so, your heart is so corrupt. You know, like we, we can understand why they beat us. We look different and we're used to it to some degree. Does that, and that's a sad mentality, but that's what we're used to, right? We're used to that, us and them. But when we see them on them, to us, we're just like, oh my God. So the, and then I heard that story over and over and over again. Like, I can't believe they would do that. You know, like they're beating on their own babies. So, um, but that was the most surprising um, ally 
that I saw was that 50% of that camp and beyond. It was amazing. So miigwech. Thank you so much. And of course, what goes along with that, you know, we are Water Clan, so you know, we're, we don't do this just for us, right? We feel it's our role to do this. That's that's part of why we're here in existence. <laughs> but it's, it's for everybody. It's for everybody's babies. Yeah, big question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say one of the uh, most surprising uh, uh, supporters I've seen is. Um, from the youth, you know, not just not just you know because you know we, we can teach our kids to to believe these things, but like to see the youth really like little kids, you know, really realize like this is screwed up, you know. I, I'm worried, you know, for them to be worried and be to for me to see the seriousness when little kids come to these things and speak about it, you know, that that really moves me a lot. Cause that that's scary, you know. Like we're dealing with it now, but like if they're that young and they're, you know, they they have that comprehension of like fear or worry or danger, you know, that's 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 something we got to take serious. Please join me in expressing gratitude for our panelists here for the Great Lakes Protection Panel.